Thijs. Um, if you want to join, I'm doing a little demo later on, so if you want to join that and also uh, like look at the code I'll be talking about, uh, please clone this repository. <coughs> um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, how to do concurrency in Ruby using just very simple stuff from the, from the standard library. So um, I work on a monitoring product uh, for Ruby called AppSignal. And we, um, uh, we support a lot of different uh, types of web servers and tools, which kind of forced me to learn about, uh, about, uh, about all the different ways you can do concurrency in Ruby. Um, and then I realized that, that uh, in the years before, this al always sort of sounded like an intimidating subject. And I felt like I didn't really understand what was going on, but it was actually uh, quite a bit easier than I thought. So today I'm here to share some of that, uh, these insights with you. So in general, there's a few exceptions to this, but for simplicity's sake, uh, we're going to be talking about these three main ways of doing concurrency. So you can, uh, you can either run multiple processes, you can run multiple threads, or you can run an event loop and, and have that kind of fake concurrency in a sense. Um, so you're probably familiar with, with these uh, free web servers. So they, they all use one of these models uh, with, with their up and down sides. Um, so the thing, uh, uh, so, so we're going to try and do this, uh, uh, discuss this su subject by building a very simple uh, chat server that's kind of like Slack. So um, I implemented uh, a little chat, chat server in, um, implemented a little chat server in Ruby in these three different ways. So my colleague Roy over there is already logged into it, hopefully. Well, of course it's not working. <laughs> Hi, Roy. <laughs> ah, it's working. <laughs> so, well, here's our, our very minimalistic Slack. I'm afraid we won't be getting uh, millions of VC funding for this, but at least it works. <laughs> Um, we'll start with, with discussing the chat client. So this file is called client.rb if you checked out the repository. Um, and this uses the just basic networking stuff from the Ruby standard library to, uh, to make a connection. So it starts by requiring a socket which brings in all this, uh, this network logic. Uh, and then it opens a, a TCP connection to, uh, to a certain uh, uh, address. And it's, then it boots up a little thread that um, uh, that just just uh, uh, asks the client to, for incoming data. So basically, any, anything the server sends back to the client will get written out to the, to the command line. And finally, it just listens on the command line. That's this scdin.get. Uh, basically, just waits for you to to type something, press enter, and then it will it will trigger that loop. Um, and then it puts that on the client. So uh, and that means that it gets written back to the server. So the server uh, receives this data and the server can write beta data back to the client. And the client is able to uh, either get user input from you or, uh, or write stuff that the server wrote back to the, to the command line. And basically this is a full uh, chat client. Um, I'm just sorry to say it doesn't support any animated GIFs, but yeah. So, um, there's a, so as discussed, there's three ways to, uh, to do this in Ruby. And the first and uh, most simple way, in a sense, is to, uh, is to use multiple processes. So this is how Unicorn works. What happens is that uh, uh, there's one master process that, that gets started by, uh, by your system. And whenever uh, uh, some work needs to be done, that forks into, uh, in, into a child process. And that child process can do some work and, uh, and, and then uh, might get killed again or, or, or will live for a little bit longer. And this worker process, uh, does the actual work, and the master process kind of manages uh, uh, these, these child processes. Um, and if you would look at this on your uh, activity monitor on your Mac or on top on, uh, on a server, it would look something like this. So you've got a master uh, and a few unicorn workers, and you could 
actually kill one of these workers uh, 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 or just let it crash. And then the master process will make sure that a new one gets spawned. And, and uh, so this is pretty resilient architecture. Uh, so what does this look like in, uh, in Ruby code? Um, we'll first start with, uh, with, with actually starting the server. So this piece of code is the same for all the examples. Basically, we start a TCP server uh, on a certain port. And that from that moment on, it just listens for, in, for in, new incoming connections. Um, and since we're using multi-process multi here, uh, these processes have a completely different namespace. So, so anytime you, uh, if you modify so, some, some variable in, in one of the processes, this won't influence the other ones at all because they're actually completely isolated by the operating system. So that's why we need a way to communicate between those because if we receive some a chat message on, on a process that's handling one connection, we need to be able to write it to all these other connections that are actually different processes. So I've simplified this a little bit. You can see the full code in the, uh, in the examples. Well, what it comes down to is that we use a, a pipe. Uh, you might have seen that on the command line if you, you can use this to, uh, to grab through uh, stuff, for example. Uh, and what happens is that a pipe is a, it's just a stream of data from one process to the, to the other. So if you open a pipe and you write from process one, the data will be listenable to from process two. So we uh, so so we uh, so we just set up this communication. The details are in the in the examples, and that will magically make sure that all the other processes all also get all the chat messages. Um, and then we uh, uh, th then we get get to the management part of uh, of how this works. So this is very similar to what Unicorn would do. Uh, so we start a loop, and, and uh, we try to accept a new connection from the server. So server.accept just waits for, uh, for somebody to connect, and whenever this happens, it, it's, it's the next iteration of the loop. Then we set up a pipe so we can write between the new process and the master, and we add this, uh, this, this pipe to the, to the uh, list of processes in the master um, to make sure that we can also write back to the child process. And then there's a little magical word that, that does a lot of stuff, um, which is fork. And what fork does is it, it just makes a complete copy of the process exactly as it is at that moment. So, so basically, uh, the moment you call fork, um, uh, anything that happens within the do end block is the new process, and, and anything behind it is the old process. So the old one is still there, and there's a new one, which is just a complete clone. Uh, which start doing work in, in uh, like the moment uh, the moment do ends, like ever, anything sorry anything inside of do and end. Which this is this is uh, actually quite a hard concept to wrap your your head around. You, I think you really have to try this out a few times on your own machine to really get it. I, I know I didn't really get any of the explanations. I really had to see it for myself to be able to understand it. Um, so now what, we, now what happened is that we have a, new, we have a child process, and this child process is aware of which, connect, of which uh, stream it's connected to. So next up, we're, uh, we can actually do some, uh, some, some chat logic. So uh, the first thing we do is, is read the first line from the socket and just assume that's a nickname. That's kind of the protocol of our chat server. The client just writes out your nickname as the first, uh, the first line. And then we just write back a little message back to the client. Um, and then what happens is, uh, this is not, line, line 31 is again simplified. This starts up a little thread that writes uh, incoming messages back to the client. So I'm sorry to say we do actually need a thread in a multiprocess example to make it all work. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to really implement the whole thing. Um, and then it just basically waits for you to time something. So there's a while loop at the at the bottom. Uh, it tries to read uh, a, a line of uh, a line of text from the socket, and that and it writes back this line of text back to the uh, to the pipe, and the pipe writes it back to the to the master process. So it's um, it's actually it's it's quite a few moving parts. So in this case, uh, doing it multi-process is actually a bit more code than uh, than the other versions. Um, sorry, uh, I skipped one thing. 
um, the, so what happens next is that the, the master process can write this text message back to all the children, and the children can write it back to your, to your terminal. And we will see how this works uh, in the demo, uh, like how this operates in reality in the demo at the end of the talk. So um, there's a few good things about multi-process uh, 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 concurrency. So one thing is that you can basically forget that such a thing as concurrency exists, because anything that happens in the process is just executed in a single thread, and uh, uh, there's no way like any thread safety issue, issues can arise. Uh, and and uh, the next good thing is that, that workers can crash. So for example, GitHub uh, already likes this model. So uh, both Unicorn and Rescue, which were written by them, um, use this model because they do a lot of callouts to the Git command on a command line. And, uh, and that has a tendency to use up a lot of memory and crash. So they, they, would, be, uh, they would have issues with a threaded model because the thread could bring, bring down the entire process. And in this case, the master will just reboot anything that crashes. Um, and the downside is, is that it uses a lot of resources. So any time you want to do anything that's, uh, that happens at the same time, you need uh, multiple processes which use uh, memory all over the place. Um, so you, it's, it's actually a very poor choice for a chat server. But it does work, as we'll see, uh, see in a bit. Um, which brings us to the next model, which is multi-threading which makes a lot more sense for a, for a chat application, actually. Uh, what happens here is, is, is that you have a single process, and uh, you can boot, within this process, you can boot threads that, that do work, uh, but they still share all the, all the memory. So if you mutate something in memory in one thread, it will also be different in, the, in, the, in another thread. Um, and that looks something like this. So again, we have the, exactly the same uh, uh, TCP server that get, TCP server that gets uh, uh, opened. Um, but then things are a bit different. So what we do here is, uh, is we're basically using this messages uh, array as a database. So anytime a, a, a new message comes in, we just put it into this array so we, so we can store it and send it to other people. But if multiple threads would be reading and writing to this uh, array at the same time, then it might actually end up coming into an inconsistent state. Because the one could be, could be reading stuff, while at the meantime another one is inserting stuff, and, and maybe then a, a message wouldn't be written to all clients, for example. Uh, and that's why we need a mutex. So a mutex um, uh, is basically like a traffic light. So, you, um, so it, 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 uh, a, a thread uh, can, can uh, lock a mutex, and, uh, and basically tell a mutex, I'm working with this data at the moment, and then when it releases the lock, then another thread can, can lock it and, and also work with the data. But they can't do it at the same time. So this enforces that, uh, that your data stays in, in a consistent uh, state. The downside, of course, is that if you have a lot of locking, then the whole thing might actually be just as slow as a single process uh, 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 application. Because, because if, if all the threads kind of like end up just doing work one by one instead of concurrently, then then you still, uh, you still don't have a concurrent system. So if you hear the word, word locking, uh, also in a database context, it's, it's kind of like how this works too. So next up, um, uh, uh, we do the same server.accept call. So again, we're waiting for, uh, for somebody connected to the server. Um, but instead of, of forking, we're actually starting a thread. So anything that happens within the do and the end block is, is running in the separate thread within the same process, that's, uh, uh, which, is, which is running sort of independently of the other threads. So again, we're reading the, the nickname from the socket, and we're writing something back to the socket. Um, and here it's slightly different. So instead of uh, having to set up all these pipes, we, we run a little, uh, 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 we run a little uh, a thread again that just sends incoming messages back to the client and reads messages from the client. Uh, if you look in the examples, you will see the implementation of these two uh, methods. They're, uh, uh, they're also, for simplicity's sake, I didn't add that here. Um, and when a new message uh, comes in, then we, um, uh, uh, we basically just push it onto, onto this, this messages array. 
which is kind of like our mock database. So we call mutex.synchronize, which, uh, which logs the mutex and makes sure that, that, only, that only our thread is currently doing anything with this messages array. Uh, and then we, push, we just push, it, push a new message onto it. So in reality, you would probably store this in Redis or, or whatever to make sure it, uh, it's, it would survive a crash of the process. And next up, um, we, we uh, write these messages back to every client every, two, every uh, 200 milliseconds. So uh, again, we have to log, uh, and then uh, uh, it, it collects all the messages that have to be sent. So we're storing a sent until uh, uh, timestamp. Yeah? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so that, that's a good question. Um, a mutex can deadlock. So if you, uh, we, it basically means that if you lock something but never release the lock, or you lock something and then you lock something else, and, kind of, and these two locks are kind of like waiting for each other, then basically uh, uh, your process will never continue doing any work. So th this is a ri also a risk of using a mutex. Um, and these kind of issues are the reason why people in general say that, uh, that, that, that programming using threads is pretty hard because you, you have to be aware of all these risks and, and, uh, and, and not do any stupid stuff. But it's very easy to do the stupid stuff. So yeah, that's kind of a problem. Um, so we got the messages we want to send and we just write them out uh, to the socket with this socket.puts line. And we sleep for a little bit. So th this is kind of, oh, you can already sort of see the Achilles heel of the system, uh, maybe, because we have to lock uh, we have to lock the messages array all the time. So if we have a lot of throughput, then probably the percentage of time that the whole, that messages array is locked will get higher and higher. And maybe at some point it will be so high that we won't actually be able to uh, uh, send out messages as fast as they come in. But I don't think at the moment we're probably not uh, not going to reach that limit. <laughs> I don't see that many people with a laptop out. <laughs> And it will look something like this in your uh, process manager. So there's a single process with a single process ID, and it's, it's just running a few threads. So there's, uh, there's another uh, thing to think about when you use threads in Ruby, which is the global interpreter lock. Um, and the global interpreter lock uh, uh, is this thing that's specific to Ruby. It, uh, uh, it's kind of like a, it's, it's kind of a relic from the past, which is still, uh, at the moment, still in the MRI version, still present. So uh, in Ruby, a line of Ruby code cannot be executed in multiple threads at the same time. So for example, if you run a few threads and you would, you would, uh, uh, you would store stuff in, in a hash, then, or do some calculations in different threads, and actually, they're just running uh, one by one instead of, instead of uh, concurrently. And the only exception to that is I.O. So if you, uh, if you write to a socket, or you write to disk, or you read to disk uh, from disk, then, um, then, uh, then the lock actually won't be active. And this is the reason why, why using threads in Ruby is often useful, because uh, especially in like a web context, or you do, doing networking, of course, most time is spent uh, doing a call to the database and getting it back. And in the meantime, Ruby can do other stuff. So in, in reality, uh, it's still quite useful, even though uh, there is this log present. And another thing is threat safety, which uh, we already discussed a little bit uh, just now. There's a risk of deadlocks. You, um, uh, if you're not careful, and you can mutate uh, things at the same time, uh, or, or and then your counters are totally off, for example. So it's, it's not really for the faint of heart to, uh, in Ruby at least, to, uh, to, uh, to do this. You, you, you do really have to know what you're doing. So the uh, positive side of this is that it, it uses a lot of memory per connection than uh, multiprocess. And you can share data easily, so you don't need to set up all this, com this communication between the processes. You can basically just have an array uh, that's stored in a central location, and the whole thing will just work. Well, and you do have to make sure that your code is thread safe. And, uh, you, and it doesn't make any sense for CPU intensive uh, operations, since these will only, will, will only run in a, in a single thread at the same time anyway. Which is rare in, in web lands, so um, it's usually not that much of an issue. 
Um, and uh, I skipped one. Uh, so if, if a thread crashes, there is a possibility that the whole process crashes and then uh, basically the whole thing is gone because there's, not, there's no, no master process making sure that it gets started again. Um, and then we get to the, to the final uh, way of doing concurrency Ruble, Ruby, which is an event loop. Uh, and the funny thing about an event loop is that it's, it's not actually concurrent. It's, it, it's, uh, uh, the trick about it is that it's so fine-grained that, it, that it, it's kind of like a magic trick. It, it seems to be very concurrent, but actually it's only doing one thing at the same time. And we'll, uh, we'll get to that in a bit. Um, and it uses very little memory per, uh, per connection, so it's, it's a good choice for something like a chat client in general. Um, and an event loop looks, looks something like this. So um, uh, it all starts with the operating system. So the operating system, of course, knows like, what kind of network connections are open and, uh, and what's going on. And you can ask the operating system to, uh, to basically tell you when, when something happened. So you, that this is called registering interest. So you can, for example, you can tell the Linux kernel, please inform me when this connection is ready for reading. And then it can just ping back to your Ruby code. Uh, and let you know. Um, yeah, so the operating system tells us like uh, this, this thing you're interested in is ready. And that get, gets pu pushed onto an event queue. So there's this list of things that are happening uh, uh, and, you can just, and you can just loop through them. So basically the event loop is doing nothing more than, than just endlessly going over this, this list of events that's in the queue. And, uh, and just doing stuff with every single one of them. Uh, usually it, it has some kind of storage. So, so, for, so in the context of a chat client, uh, you want to know the nickname of the person that's, uh, that's, that's, that, that's, that's connected uh, through, through a certain stream. Because when a message comes in, you want to be able to like, know who this person is so you can write, write the nickname to uh, back out there. And the event loop can often also um, add an event and it can, it can uh, ask the kernel to, uh, to, uh, to tell you when something happens. So basically this is a single process usually and a single thread and it's just endlessly spinning around and waiting for stuff to happen and, and it reacts to something and it writes so, something to a stream and then it just goes on to the next tick of the loop. Um, so, in, uh, so you need quite tight uh, operating system integration to make this work. And in Ruby, there's a gem called Event Machine that offers this integration. So you, um, if you would actually do something in production, you would need something like that. At least, maybe it will end up in, in uh, Ruby itself at some point too. I hear they're uh, thinking about doing uh, uh, like a more, maybe like an actor-based concurrency model. So then, then stuff, stuff like this will be easier. But for now, um, I kind of cheated, and I, I made a, I made a uh, kind of like a, a not so nice event loop, but it's, at least it's simple. So what we're doing is we're, we're using a fiber and, uh, and io.select. io.select is a, is a function that's in the Ruby standard library, and uh, you can pass a, a list of, of sockets, of io descriptors into it, like a socket or something on the file system. And you can ask, uh, ask it, please inform me when one of these, uh, these sockets is ready for reading or writing. Uh, we'll get to that in a bit. But first, fibers. So fiber is a new, uh, is a new concurrency uh, uh, construct that was introduced in uh, Ruby 1.9, I think. Um, it's kind of like a thread, uh, only much more lightweight. So it has a very small tech, stack of, uh, at the moment, 32 kilobytes per fiber. Uh, and it, uh, it operates like, like a thread. Um, but you can pause it and resume it at any, at any time you like. So in this example, uh, we have a little fiber that's, that's looping around, and um, it, it calls fiber.yield. And fiber.yield is, uh, is, is uh, basically pauses until resume is called on the fiber. And whenever a resume is called, then uh, uh, the yield call continues and, uh, and the fiber does whatever work. So in this case, the console output would be one, two, three, four, because we're just asking the fiber to, to, uh, to put this back to the console. So uh, a fiber is kind of like, uh, like, a, like a Go routine, which 
uh, on, the, on the Go uh, interpreter schedules the, the Go routine itself, and in Ruby Fiber, so you have to be able, you have to do this yourself. So if you don't resume, then this this fiber will just endlessly be paused. So again, we have these, these same example, uh, the same uh, TCP server opening, nothing changed there. Um, and then we have a list of clients and a list of messages. And we don't need the mu uh, mutex here because it's, it's just a single thread. There's, there's no actual concurrency going on. It's, it's just uh, faking it, basically. And in the client's uh, hash, we'll store uh, some, some metadata. We'll store a fiber for every connection. So this, this is basically what our, our, uh, our chat uh, uh, server client rep representation is. So anytime uh, uh, we, a new connection gets opened, we, uh, we start a fiber that's just endlessly looping, and it, it waits for, for itself to either become readable or writable. So the event loop will tell the fiber, this, uh, you're now readable and you can do some work. And, um, uh, uh, and, and then it can actually do the work. I, I get the sense that this is a little bit confusing. So um, uh, let me think how to maybe explain it a bit better. I, we'll, we'll just see on the next slide what happens. Um, hopefully it will be a bit clearer then. So when the fiber is, uh, uh, is in a readable state, it again can read some data from the socket and push this onto the list of messages. And when it's in a writable state, it again, it, it gets the messages have to be written uh, uh, from, the, from the list of messages and writes them back to the client. And then it stores the last write timestamp, so, so it knows that next time around, it doesn't have to send the same messages yet again. Um, and then we get to the actual event loop. So, so this is a fully functioning uh, event loop. It, it, it just loops uh, endlessly. And it starts by trying to uh, see if there are any new connections and, uh, and storing these in the list of clients. Um, then it tries to uh, ask the operating system, do you have any connections that are, that are ready for reading and writing? And then it reads from the readable connections and it writes from the writable connections. So we'll, uh, uh, we'll go over all four of these uh, in a bit more detail now. Um, in this case, it's, it's, it's again calling server.accept, only this time we use the non-block version. And the, uh, the only difference is that server.accept just waits for new connections, and non-block immediately returns. So it just tries to uh, get, a, get a connection. If there's no such thing, it just uh, continues. And we will um, get, uh, it will, and it will raise an exception. So if there's an exception here, we can just continue with the loop. Um, yeah, then we get to the next step. Uh, we just ask the operating system, please tell us which one of these, uh, these are writable or readable. Like in a real event loop, this would, uh, this, th you would do this in a more scalable way. So this is, this is kind of, this is really a poor man's version of, of how to do that. And we have sort of the same code again as, as we've seen earlier. It, it, uh, it pushes uh, uh, a message back onto the, onto the messages list. And the writable code is also sort of the same. So the, the, the upside of an event loop system is that it has a very, uh, 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 very low overhead per connection. And it scales up to a huge number of uh, parallel connections for this, this reason. Um, Downside is that uh, uh, you probably already know this if you ever use JavaScript, but if you get a more complex uh, event loop system, you often end up with something like callbacks to be able to manage everything. And then the whole thing can get very hard to debug because everything is calling each other and uh, there's a huge stack. Um, and the finally, uh, and very importantly, uh, since it's a, a single thread in a single process, like if, 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 you, if it stops, then the whole thing is, is stops. So, for example, if uh, we go back to this, uh, this example, if, if um, uh, the reading in this case would just, would just take a very long time for some reason, like nothing would be read from any client at all. Um, so you do, 
need to have a workload that uh, that is suitable to like to being cut up on very small pieces. So which one to use? Well, as always, uh, the answer is it, it depends. Um, so if you, uh, if, if, you, if you have stuff that can crash, then the multiprocess approach is very good. Uh, Multithreading is a nice one, because uh, it's relatively simple, and, uh, uh, and you don't need to convert your whole code to uh, using an event-based model. And the event loop is nice if you need a lot of concurrency. So uh, let's, let's try it out on my laptop and see, uh, see how, the, how this uh, chat server actually works. So um, uh, uh, maybe you already checked out the example code. Um, I know Roy has, so at least I can chat with Roy. Um, you can connect to my laptop by, uh, by running uh, uh, the command below. If you checked it out at the absolute beginning of the, uh, before the presentation, please pull because I fixed the bug. Did everybody who wants to get that? I should get a different first name. So there's already some people in, in our Slack. <laughs> so uh, I'm currently running the evented version. So um, if you look at um, If you look at the uh, Ruby processes uh, running in my in, on my machine, you can see this at the uh, left. Uh, uh, bottom side of, uh, of the terminal. There's just the client, which is running on the right side, and the server, which is running on the left side. So if we, if we inspect the server uh, a bit more, And this is a list of all the threads that are active in this process. So um, you guys are a bit slow. I did this talk in uh, in Belarus uh, last week, and they they like hacked this whole thing within within five minutes. <laughs> so I am a bit disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we um, so this is the event version, and as you can see, um, there's only there's, there's only one thread running in this process at the moment. So let's let's move over to the to the threaded version. Sorry, guys, you'll you'll have to reconnect actually once I restart. So here again on the left side there's a list of threads and you can see that that it just boots up a thread for uh, for every incoming connection. Um, I've I've tried to measure the difference between uh, the performance of the event and the threaded version, but that's that's kind of negligible, and I think that's probably because I'm using io.select instead of uh, an actual proper event system. So uh, we can't really see the difference in any resource usage here, uh, unfortunately. Oh, let me connect it. Okay, so finally, we'll, um, we'll start uh, the, the multi-process version. And this is the one we'll, that will break the, the easiest. That's why I'm doing it, at, doing it as the last one, because if my laptop crashes, I'm like, the presentation is done, so who cares? <laughs> So uh, this is a different, uh, this is the PS3 tree command, which uh, shows you uh, a tree of, of all processes and their children. And it's, um, you can see here that at the, that at the top, uh, there's the master process, and then and like one step nested into that, we see a bunch of, of uh, child processes. And, um, well, somebody knows how to write the loop. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, let me just see if um, how many processes we have right now. Oh, it's, uh, so there are about 10 people logged into the server at the moment. Um, yeah, and this, uh, this, uh, this concludes my presentation. Um, so, so uh, the question is, how did I, how did I apply this mon this knowledge? And uh, so I, I work a lot on a on a gem for uh, for Ruby and Rails, uh, uh, which is called AppSignal, and it's a, it's a monitoring gem. So basically, it hooks into into the web server and, uh, and fetch, gets a lot of information and processes that and sends it, sends it back to us. So uh, basically, I've been debugging everybody's weird bugs for uh, for, for for more than a year and which forced, forced me to learn this. Well, thank you.